it sounds pretty cool. I mean, everybody knows how it sounds. Hey Garden Church, my name is Michael. Hi, I'm Haley, and welcome to our gathering. As part of our community, we want you to feel valued and connected. So while you're here, type in your name and where you're watching from in the chat. Yes, we would love to hear from you, and if you have any questions or would like more information about our community, you can go to garden.church or download our app. We hope you enjoy this gathering, and we will be seeing you at the end of this live stream. Yeah, I like, I
Good morning, Garden Church. Well, you guys made it through the marathon. Hey, right? you broke the barriers, made it. So glad you guys are here. And we, yeah, are excited to have more people come as they make their way through the marathon. But yeah, would you guys stand with us and we'll open up in a word of prayer. Yeah, Holy Spirit, we want more of you. Yeah, would you come into this place? Would you invade it, Lord? Would you invade our minds and our hearts? Would you wash over us this morning as we just pour out our love for you? We're so grateful for you. We thank you, Father. There's so much to be thankful for. You're such a good, good Father. You're so kind. Spirit, come. Yeah, we want to give you this time. We want you to lead us. Yeah, yeah we love you, Jesus. Amen. This is the word here in the flesh, living among the meek and lowly, the voice of God, his every breath, salvation of the
lays his heart upon the cross and from his wounds his mercies flow and now the dawn is put dead to death and ever since that
darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light in the kingdom of light forever under your dominion you're the king of my life you're the king of my life as you reign above it all you reign above it all and over the universe and over every heart there is no higher name jesus you reign Cross the word is finished. Yes, poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, hear the anthem arise. Cause Jesus, you are a darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory throned on the highest praise because you sent the darkness running
Jesus, you reign above it all. let the praise pour out of your mouth what you're feeling in your heart right now just let it pour out of your mouth let your ears hear those praises Oh 
Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Can we just stay right here for a moment? Just linger. Just hold your hands out. Open your eyes. Or close your eyes and open your hands. Just all you kids up here, would you just hold your hands out like this and close your eyes? I just want to invite the presence of God to be with us today. He makes this promise in Scripture that he'll never leave us or forsake us, that he's with us. Jesus says uh, to wait in Jerusalem to receive the gift from the Father. And he says, you will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses to be men and women who reflect Jesus, the resurrected Messiah, into the world. So, Lord, we just invite you as we honor your presence, as we honor you as the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as we honor you as the creator of all things. Through you, all things have been made. You are the word. You are the alpha. You are the omega. You are the beginning. You are the end. You are the first. You are the last. You are the, you are the line of Judah, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You are uh, Jehovah Jireh, the provider. We bless you. Thank you, Lord. Just stay here for a moment. I want a place where our kids can come and just linger and learn how to worship and be in the presence of God. So just wait for a few moments. I know waiting's hard. Wherever you are, would you just invite God's presence to be with you today? Maybe you had a rough week, you're tired. I talked to so many of you, it's, you're tired. Why don't you invite God to give you rest right now? Not that you check out with a Netflix show or that pizza or Chinese food that you're longing for at the end of the week. Not escape from the world, but right in the midst of everything you're carrying, God give you a new way to carry life through his presence. That's what Sabbath is about. That we get to enter into Sabbath's rest. It is not just a routine on Saturday or a bunch of legalistic disciplines. This is a way of life where those of us that have been burdened and weary by the world, we can enter into life carrying new things through the power and presence of God with us. So Father, we worship you. We honor you. We welcome you into our life. I pray that you would be Lord and King in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Garden Church. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Take a few minutes, grab some hands, say hi to the people around you, ask them how their week's going. Kids, youth, great job. We're glad you're here too. All right, Garden Church, welcome. We're so glad you're with us. We are Garden Church. This is a rhythm of our, our gathering as people of God. We worship on Sundays. We meet in house churches, missional communities. We also have remnant groups. We have trainings going on. We want you to live the way of Jesus wherever you are. And if you're new, welcome. If you're visiting, look, we'd love to get connected to you. There's a coffee cart uh, for coffee. That's something else. I'm not, there's a welcome cart also on the back. On your way out, fill out a Connect card or download our app, go online, yes. click the section that says, Are You New? We'd love to get you plugged in to, to let you know of what's happening in our community. So good. Hey, anyone run the marathon this morning? Anyone? I, we had a couple people last year, so I'm just, you know, maybe they're still running. I know Amanda ran a 5K. Congratulations to her. Uh, yes, but if Amanda. You, I know if it was difficult getting here, thank you for making the, the trek out. But yeah, my name is John, one of the other pastors here. Um, I'm going to have the ushers come forward and pass the buckets for offering. It's the time that we give our offerings um, to, uh, to God. And we practice this as a way of worship. You know, it says everyone should give what they have determined in their heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
And I think what God was reminding me this morning is just that we need to bring this stuff to our minds and it not just be this secondary third thing that we think of, that when we sing a song of worship that we give our all to Jesus and we see him on the throne, that it is a way that we get to model this. So in your own minds and hearts, bring this to mind and determine what it is that looks like to give in this season, especially if you're calling the garden home. Uh, We have all of our financial information online. If you are new to our church, all that's available on our website if you want to check that out. But as the bucket's passed, feel free free to give. You can give online as well, and offering boxes in the back if you need envelopes. All right, just a couple of announcements. First of all, Empowered is happening in two weeks. Check this out. I'll give you the details in a second. It's on the screen, but here's the deal. I, um, I want everyone that goes to the garden to come to Empowered. Here's the deal. Empowered, we started years ago in 2010 as a weekend set apart for Garden Church to recenter on the ministry and power of the Holy Spirit. We have been committed to being a church where the presence of God rests, where the people of God learn to operate naturally supernatural in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so every year we dedicate a a weekend. We have friends come that have carried something. And this year we have Chris Valatin. Chris Valatin uh, is one of the senior leaders at Bethel. He started the Supernatural School of Ministry. Um, He's he's known for lots of things. People know of him in the Christian world. He's like a famous Christian or something. But he's a friend. And he's been a friend to my wife and I. This is a man who has invested in my marriage. He's invested in in Alex and myself. He has called me randomly when I was running saying, I need to talk to you. I have a word from the Lord. Get your wife on Zoom right now. So we get on Zoom and then he gives us this word that is so detailed and so unbelievable with specifics about our, each of our children and what they were experiencing about what was happening in our marriage, it set us on a trajectory that changed in a moment our lives. That's, he, he operates in the prophetic and his hope for us is to be with us, but to share with us what does it look like to grow as the body in a prophetic imagination and operate in what should be normal for Christians. And so, look, we have, um, we have a bunch of things. First of all, it's the 21st and 22nd of October, um, all day Friday, all day Saturday. And so if you can only come one day, come Saturday, if that's the only day, I, it doesn't matter. We'd love for you to be there. Um, I would get work off to be here. It's going to be amazing. We also have Julian Adams coming. I forgot, by the way. We also have Julian, which we, we love Julian. Um, And there's a code for you to get it for cheaper. If that's still too expensive, look, we're not trying to make money. We're just paying for friends to come down here, honor their time, pay for their hotels and and the facility that we don't own. We still don't own a building. Um, But one day, Lord willing, we will have our own place. Keep praying with us. But we'll give you a discount code, okay? So if you want to you want to come and that's too much, email me or info at garden.church. I will hook you up. I want you there, okay? And if you want to volunteer as well, that's another way to get some discounted pricing for the conference as well. Yes, volunteer first and then I'll volunteer give you a first. Code. Yes. Yes. And then yes. Boom. It's always a cost. All right. Uh, hey, that's it. Let me pray that's for it. you. Can Wait, I'm gonna you? say a couple things then. I'll oh, pray. Yeah. Thank you. All right. John, you look great. John just turned 40. Look at this oh, man. He's gosh. over the hill. <laughs> Happy birthday. Um all right, it says invite Bill up. Is Bill preaching and I don't know that? Because I... <laughs> two things I want to share. First of all, I was traveling the last two weeks with friends. I'm sorry, with friends, my family. Visiting friends. <laughs> visiting friends of ours, Julian and Kathy Adams. Um, I'm part of the leadership of that church. I help oversee that as an overseer in that community. And Alex and I spent the weekend with their leaders, their staff, um, and their church preaching, investing in, in relationships. They're committed. We're committed to them. They're committed to us. And we had an exceptional time in Boston. Some of you are on a prayer chain for us because a few weeks ago we had a crazy experience and you guys started interceding for us. So I want to just say this was one of the best trips we've ever had traveling. I have personally had my family didn't get sick, um, we, which is a miracle. There were no issues. So I just come back with a praise report. Boston was amazing. And then we went to New York and I was uh, ministering to a church called Church of the City, which is in Manhattan. Um, They have four services on Sunday and they're doing a series called The Jesus Stuff. And my friend, John Tyson, who I've been a part of a pastor group for the last eight years, I've talked about this group that goes away every year where we confess our sins, we pray for each other, we prophesy. We just encourage each other to go after the things we're passionate about. Um, Well, I got to be a part of his church and I preached on the ministry of healing. 
Um, which is always like one of those sermons where you're like, cool, like I'd rather give a good talk and walk away knowing that we'll just let the seeds go. But talking about healing today is always a risk. So I asked specifically that God would show up in power. So a bunch of you were praying and I have to say there were loads of healings. Like the reports are phenomenal. I'm getting emails and texts from their leaders. People with serious conditions were healed. Um, people that couldn't sleep were sleeping. People that had chronic back pain were healed, chronic fatigue. Um, people that, there's, uh, well, my favorite part, I'll just share this story, is um, in the second service, they had the youth come into the service and I was talking to them before. I said, hey, would you guys want to pray uh, with, with me as I pray for healing? And some were reluct reluctant. So two of them came up after, after I taught and we started praying. And then all, like, we were like eight, 13, 14, 15 year old girls. And they prayed. I just coached them in the healing prayer that we've trained people in here. Very simple prayer. I didn't touch anyone and lay hands. They laid hands and they prayed for people and they saw loads of healing. There was a, a girl who couldn't bend her wrist and then she was doing this. She's like, I haven't been able to do this in 14 years. She's weeping as God takes away the pain in her wrist. And the, 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 the high, or junior high and high schoolers were the ones praying. Another girl takes off her cast, gets barefoot and starts jumping. I'm like, whoa, hey, easy. And she's like, the pain's gone, completely healed. Back pain gone. Like these, and the, the youth, the report from the youth is their faith is real. Jesus is real. The Jesus stuff is real. And I just want to say, we got to keep going for it. We just got to keep going for it, right? So I want to, I, we're seeing this on Sunday. We're telling stories in our staff. We're telling stories here. We want to keep the hunger alive. Like we talked about this. We, we can't just try to convince the world of some beautiful song someplace else. We got we to gotta tell the world, no, no, listen for yourselves. You got to hear the music. Jesus invites us in to say the kingdom of God is a reality to be experienced. So that's the, that's the report I have. I have a talk, um, but I wanted to just share uh, a personal thing real quick because uh, my mentor, my spiritual father, a friend of Garden Church, uh, died a couple weeks ago. This is Don Williams. I think we have a picture. My, you guys know Don. He's, he used to be here for, I don't know, he attended for five years. Um, Don was the, the uh, a, a pastor of the Presby Hollywood Presbyterian in the 60s. He was part of the Jesus movement. He was uh, planted a, a Presbyterian church and then he became um, a vineyard pastor. He was the vineyard theologian. Um, wrote so many books and he, PhD, MDiv, he was so many things, but he was like my spiritual father. Um, so, you know, if it wasn't for Don, Todd Proctor, pastor of Rock Harbor, would have never been connected to the UK. Um, and I never would have been on a trip to the UK where I was, I, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. If it wasn't for Don, um, loads of things wouldn't have happened in the kingdom. He has been, was an incredible man. He has a legacy of people he's discipled and we are fruit of his ministry. Garden Church is a fruit of his ministry. So many of my values as a leader come from this man. Um, like you've heard me say, the meaning of life is relationship. Discipleship is monkey see, monkey do. He's taught me how to build a church, a church within the church. He, I, I, I have discipled so many men and women in this church and I've always taken them to hang out with Don and that has been a meaningful moment. So I just wanna let you know, he passed away. He's with Jesus. Um, we are gonna continue on in his legacy. Um, we will miss him here. He hasn't come back because during COVID he wasn't able to come, but he used to sit in the front row. And after every sermon, he would come up and grab me by the back of my head and, and get me really close. And he's like, that was the best sermon I've ever heard. And <laughs> I, I miss him tremendously. But we'll have a, a service at Rock Harbor in, uh, in the next couple months or so that we'll lead. If, if you want more information, just follow along, uh, sign up for an email. But I just want to let you know he passed. So I'm grateful for him. And I want you to know he, he's really impacted our church. So um, all that to say, I'm more convinced convicted and convinced that the things we're doing matter for eternity. Um, and our lives today, here and now, our relationships to one another matter. It's not about a website. It's not about Instagram. It's not about, oh, we got to be about a movement and revival. Look, it's about relationships together. I'm all for revival. But if we don't have loving relationships, if we're not living out the things of Jesus with our families, our relationships here, it doesn't matter. You know, this, this man... Uh, 
Don, he, he wrote his entire dissertation, his entire philosophy of ministry is on the imitation of Christ in Paulian literature. So he's an expert in Paul, studied at Princeton and Union, which is Columbia University. The smart, he studied with C.H. Dodd, the famous New Testament scholar, one of my heroes. He, he was under lectures with Karl Barth. This, this man lived so much and he, he would take all of that intellect and he would say, look, discipleship, is monkey see, monkey do. At the end of the day, it's embodying it. And we got to go for it, church. We got to go for it, all right? Don't waste any more time. Can I pray? Father, I thank you for um, the shoulders that we stand on. I'm reminded of Hebrews where we're in a cloud of witnesses, a great cloud of witnesses, of men and women who have gone before for us and have lived faithfully in front of us and have created pathways to make it easier for us. I thank you, Jesus, uh, for this church, this local body of followers of Jesus um, that believe your kingdom has come and your will um, is being done. And we are part of this great, epic renewal project called the Renewal of All Things. Now we've given our lives to you, Jesus, to partner with you in this journey. I pray, Jesus, that you, you would help us as we talk about things that could be um, confusing. I pray for clarity of thought and wisdom. And I pray more than anything, you set people free today in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the sermon is Demonized. So let's just go to Mark chapter 4. I don't know how to transition from there. <clears throat> we're in a series called Deliver Us. And um, we're talking about uh, spiritual warfare. We're talking about the, the, the unseen realm. We're talking about becoming the kind of people that have a warfare worldview. So if you've missed the last four weeks, there's a whole lot of work we've done to make things that I'm saying today um, easier to grasp, right? So I, some of the things we're going to talk about are going to be, for those of you that are showing up, there'll, there'll be a huge leap to get to. So just understand that there's, there's work we've done about developing a, a, super, a, a spiritual warfare worldview, recognizing that if you read the Gospels, the ministry of Jesus is primarily about proclaiming the kingdom, healing the sick, and casting out demons. Those are the three things he does more than anything else. Um, two weeks ago... Um, Alex and Hannah Absalom talked about deliverance and gave you some practical tools for deliverance ministry. And they talked about the deliverance that happens in the book of Acts. Last week, Bill was in Ephesians. Um, and today we're going to talk about, we're just going to zoom in on one story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play around and give you, answer some questions I've received. But also play around with one particular story found in the gospel of Mark. So Mark chapter 4, we'll start there. Mark chapter 4, um, verse 35. In, in the header, it says that Jesus calms the storm. Now, I don't have this up, but Mark 4, it says this. It says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Now, I want to I set up the story I'm going to talk about, which is in Mark chapter 5. But Mark 4 becomes before chapter 5. And that's, that's wisdom. That's, you know, intellect. The intelligence is just oozing out of me today. You're welcome. Um, the sophisticator, the sophistication, sophisticators, the bluffers. <clears throat> so when we read uh, any text, I, when you're trying to underst understand scripture, you've got to understand the context of that story. And you can't read chapter five without realizing what happens right before in chapter four, right? So that's important. And this setup is like, it's, it's a comedy. It's a, it's a, it's, or you could say it's like a horror film. There's like rules to horror films. I don't watch horror films. I get terrified too easily. Um, but like, there's like, there's formulas for romantic comedies, right? There's formulas for um, Marvel films or any of these epic films. There's like a formula that you see. And in chapter four, it's setting chapter five up for something. And here's what I want to give you is the mindset of chapter four. So Jesus tells his disciples who are mostly fishermen, we're going to go in the boat at night and we're going to go to the other side, okay? Now, here's the problem. For in the first century, you would never go across the lake. Even if that was the fastest route, you would go around the lake near the shore. You would stay pretty close to the shore where you could see the sea line, right? Or I'm sorry, the, the beach. You would want to be close because it wasn't something that they would regularly do. You would never do it at night, 
Never would you go. You go early in the morning. You might fish at night, but you would stay close to the shore. So there's two things that like practical wisdom, tradition, like you think these boys um, that were raised by fishermen would have been taught by their dads or their mom and dads about, hey, this is just practical wisdom. This is what we do as fishermen. We don't, we don't go to the other side and we don't do it at night. For lots of reasons, it's just not safe, but also superstition in that first century context, we have this mindset that the seas, especially in the Old Testament, we see this in uh, Hebrew writing, they, that was the territory for demonic and spiritual beings that oppose Yahweh. So first century mindset is the, the seas and the, uh, the, the oceans are represent chaos, Leviathans, raging, uncontrolled creation has power, dominion, rule over those things. And so um, over the sea. So there's this superstition where you, you wouldn't do it because it's, it's the territory of evil spirits. On top of that, the other side is the Gerasenes, it's Gentile territory. So not only is it evil spirits that over, overpower and overrule the, the sea and the waters, the other side are full of idolaters, witchcraft. They worship other deities and gods. They are unclean people. And if you study the Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament, you recognize there's a lot of laws and rules about protecting yourself from being unclean. Are you with me, guys? Okay, so um, Jesus says, let's go to the other side. Now, what happens is a storm ha takes off, right? So you know this, right? There, there's a squall, which, you know, historically or geographically, look, the Sea of Galilee is over 700 feet below sea level. And then there's all these mountaintops and hills that, that are on the bridge of the land. So it was common for wind to come and create squalls and storms. That was a very common ex experience. Now, if you were a first century Jewish boy in the boat with Jesus, you'd be like, I knew it. Daddy told me not to do this. And now it's happened. The worst case scenario is how everything I was warned about is happening. And they're shoving, they're shoveling water out, right? And they wake Jesus up in the boat. Jesus is sleeping. And they're like, aren't you, don't you care that we're going to die? They're like all the things are happening. And then in verse 39, it says he got up. Now, I, I just, it's not up there, but you need to read this. Rebuked the wind and spoke to the waves. Be, or he says, quiet, be still. Greek translation is shut up. <laughs> so the point of the first point is don't wake up Jesus when he's napping, um, which translates today, don't wake up your parents' kids when your parents are napping. Uh, that's, I'll preach that in the kids' ministry later. Um, no, the point is he, 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 in Mark's gospel, this is an exorcism. This is the same formula for all of the 13 plus exorcisms that take place. And then immediately it says, then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And then verse 41, it leaves them. Listen to how 41 ends and then it's gonna start in chapter five. The disciples, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Okay, so you have all sorts of stuff happening, right? But the thing is, like, have you ever been in a situation where you're scared and then, like, you change something and then you get even more afraid? Like, you know, like, I remember recently, or recently, years ago when Alex and I were dating, we went on a family reunion with her family. They were, in which, like, 180 family members would go camping, right? This is before we were married. So I, I was like, I don't see what I'm getting into. And I was like, I don't know why I got out. I didn't get out then. But I'll tell you this, 180 Nunnix, right? That's their last name, Nunnix on that side. And they went camping and we, we got into the back of one of her cousin's giant trucks. And there were like 30 of us sitting in the back because we were gonna go to the lake and we had to drive from the campsite to the lake. And it was this windy off-road thing. And Alex and I were terrified. I thought we, like the cliff was down here and we're like driving and we thought we were going to literally fall off. So we're like, you know what? We're just going to walk the rest of the way, stop the car. We got out and, and we start walking. They take off. And it was like a good mile away through this windy road. And, and then we start hearing, t -t 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 
snakes. No joke. It's called Rattlesnake Valley or something like that. And this is a true story. And I, I was thinking, man, this one moment was scary, but now I'm even more terrified. So then we didn't make it to the water. We just stood on a rock. She didn't want to go any further. I was fine. She didn't want to go any further. But have you ever been in a situation where you're like, all of a sudden you're afraid, but then all of a sudden you have this greater awareness. And you're like, oh, crud, what did I just do? That's what's happening with the disciples. They're like, our superstition is that this place is demon possessed. And then he speaks and the power and creation calms. And now they're terrified going, uh-oh, who's in the boat? Do you realize what's going on? Okay, so that is the setup for what's next. Okay, so stick with me. Chapter 5, verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the Gentiles, the idolaters, the worshiping worshipers of other gods, the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, so this territory is unclean. As soon as he steps out of the boat, their fears become reality. When, they, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came running after them from the tombs. Just, you can't make this stuff up, guys. The, the first century context is this is like a, a formula for a horror film. It's Halloween. I'm seeing all the decorations. I'm getting ads on the, you know, everywhere. That person smiling on that bus you know, like it says smile. It's terrifying me. <laughs> this man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore. Not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice. So just imagine a man shouting at the top of his voice. A man who's living in the tombs. A man who's cutting himself up with stones. A man who has the strength to break chains. A man sh meets the disciples who've just survived this storm and says, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. I mean, we, we really domesticate this story. What kind of voice would come out of a man possessed with legions? What, what does he smell like? What does he look like? What does his eyes look like? These clothes. So this is, this is, so you have all the superstition for these disciples, right? So Mark writes the gospel of Mark so that you as a disciple know what it means to be a disciple and what, who Jesus really was so that you could follow after him, all right? So the whole point is that you pick up your cross and follow him. And so you have these stories where the disciples don't get it. They're asking, who is this guy? They don't get it till chapter eight. So they're terrified. He rebuked, he exercised the storm, and now we're going to the side that mom and dad told us when we were kids, don't go because it's filled with all sorts of evil. And right when we get there, evil comes running to us. Who is this that rebukes the winds, the disciples ask? And it's the demon that answers the question. You are the son of the most high. Don't torture me. That word torture is found in Revelation and it's connected to the final judgment that Jesus has for angels. There is this reality happening that if you pull back the curtain, you see what's going on and you have to get there. We have to understand this is not a battle moment. This is a moment of compassion and liberation. So let's, let's peer in for a moment. This is the, the man, the demonized man. Mark tells us a little bit of his story. This man has an impure spirit. This man uh, has had a community of people. The town at points in his life tried to restrain him, but he would break out over and over again. And so they would tie him up. They would use force. They would use systems and policies and all sorts of things to chain him, but he would break those chains and he was 
longing for healing and wholeness and freedom, but the, the power that the, the community had, the witch doctors and the experts and the politicians, they, they were using their power, which was force, and that resulted in a man's isolation. In a, it, 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 it resulted in a man's longing for something else to the point where he cuts himself. He cries out at night. And you could just imagine uh, what, what people do when individuals don't align to the protocols. What corporate institutions do quickly when someone doesn't abide or comply with the rules. For everyone's safety, crazy Marvin's going to live in the tombs. We're going to isolate ourselves from him. And then we're going to tell stories about this man. Right? Just, I'm just making this stuff up now. This is my own imagination with the text. The townspeople would tell their kids, and hey, you better go to bed early because otherwise crazy Marvin's going to come and get you. Marvin is the demonized man. In case you missed that, I'm just making up his name. Right? Like, you're like, oh, well, oh, you, you see him in town because you hear the chains that have been broken dragging behind him. And you like, don't, don't, nope, nope, come over here. We're going to walk this way. Avoid this person because our limited human capacity has resulted in this man's continued suffering. That, this, is, this is what I see. I see a man who's, who's broken, who's living in isolation. He's the man that's ha being pressed to the forgotten places of the town, the tombs, the hills, under the overpass, institutions, jails, prisons, borders, abandoned buildings. He would cut himself. He would scream. He would cry out. He was held hostage by evil. Longing for freedom and connection, he was alone and isolated, and the city had given up on him. What do you think would happen today? So in the first century, doctors couldn't heal him. Therapists couldn't fix him. Um, which doctors couldn't do anything, so they, they just leave him to be the man in isolation. That's the scene. So the disciples are like, who is this? And then there's, they're, they're, they're confronted with the, the reality of this moment, shouting at the top of the lungs, this is who that person is. The person in the boat is Jesus, the son of the most high God. Now here's the reality I want to get into. At some point, this man became possessed. That's a word that's not a biblical word, to be honest. It's not in the Greek. Um, not just with some demon, with demons, right? Legion is the name of this demon, which we'll get to in a second. But the truth is, I want to let you in, so lean in on this. The truth is, people can open themselves up to evil through habitual, unrepentant unrepent sin, drug, alcohol abuse. All of those things enable a person to not be self-controlled or under the alert of the Spirit, like the Bible says, but they can open themselves up to evil through all sorts of the false religions, spirituality in general, cultic behaviors. Cutting yourself is a cult practice that is a form of pagan worship that dates back to thousands of years ago. Prophets of Baal would cut themselves as a way to, to conjure a response from their deity who was silenced and absent. So other religions used mechanisms, uh, ways of, of, of control, trying to control life to get the outcome they wanted. And people would participate in these types of activity. And I just have to let you know that demonic activity is real today. Good? I mean, it's not good, but do you understand this? I love what uh, Rob Reamer says. He, l listen to this. So this, we're talking about how do you open yourself up to evil? I don't think it's as clear as I was participating in witchcraft or a cult. That is clearly a way. There are other ways that are more insidious and less obvious. He says this, every time we pick up the tool of rebellion, we are picking up a tool of darkness and it can only lead to bondage. Never freedom. For example, if someone sins against us and hurts us, Jesus tells us to forgive them, to bless those who curse us. If we forgive, we pick up the tool of the kingdom of God and we give ac uh, access to God. If we hold on to bitterness, 
We are picking up the tool of the kingdom of Satan and we are giving access to Satan. Paul says that the devil gets a foothold, ground. He gets access in Ephesians chapter four, verse 27. Humanity is locked in Satan's dark kingdom and its effects because we have all sinned and given Satan access. So our lives are saturated with the fruits of darkness, Pain, suffering, sorrow, injustice, sickness, demonization, bondage, addiction, poverty, and the like. These things were not a part of God's design in the beginning, and they will not be found in heaven. I can't overemphasize this enough. Like, I want to, you know, how, we'll talk about how you get to this dramatic form of demonization, which we'll call possession. Um, I want to talk about how we don't live in a world that's neutral, we're not living in a moment where the, the, the world is like, there are things that, that you do that are just neutral. I believe everything is contested. So it's either the kingdom of God and bringing light or it's part of the kingdom of darkness. I know that's hard to hear, but the only reason we believe that it's okay and things are good is because we live in our Western context, which is formed out of the enlightenment and scientific reason and rationalization, which means we're all good and everything's fine. There's this, there's this progression towards a utopia without a king. There's this life without, where that, that looks like the kingdom, but it doesn't have Jesus. Jesus as king. And so we live in that, we swim in that culture. And so we, we participate in things because we've been influenced by our culture. There's a therapy culture. There is a self-narcissistic culture. There is a pleasure culture. There's all these things. And it's like, so if everyone else is doing it, then it's okay. But I have to say, that's not what the Bible teaches. All right, so the Bible teaches that a, a biblical worldview is it's either part of the God's kingdom or it's part of the kingdom of Satan. So when somebody hurts you, let's say like someone's a stranger to you, like your spouse. Like this is where the demonic activity gets real. I mean this sincerely. Your spouse hurts you. A spou your spouse hurts you and you don't forgive them fully because it keeps happening. So you hold on to that hurt and then you build, that hurt turns into bitterness and resentment. You start resenting your spouse. And then that resentment turns into a prison called unforgiveness. And now you give permission. You give the enemy legal access to your heart because you're operating in the tools of darkness. Are you guys okay with this? Do you see this? So what begins perhaps with things like pain that need to be healed turns into f collecting injustice. Your mind and your eyes now, your mind has been formed by injustice that, that has wrong, you've been wrongfully hurt. And rather than walking in forgiveness towards light, you collect the injustice and now your mind and your eyes can only see the injustice that's been done to you. And you live now under the influence of that unforgiveness. And now lies come into your head. Things like, uh, it will always be this way. Don't open your heart again. They will always hurt you. And you start agreeing with the lies of the enemy. They become your narratives. And now you live out of habits that have been formed by darkness. And more and more you open yourselves up to where now you're being um, influenced, inhabited by demonic. This is where that route goes. I'll get there in a little bit. Um, but what happens when you don't operate out of the kingdom of God, when you choose to disobey scriptures and live that way, just that's one example. We could talk about lust and pornography. We could talk about anger and, and, and we could talk about social media you becoming an ecosystem for anger and outrage. It creates an ecosystem. So you can create an ecosystem in your life that will create a culture of the kingdom of God or you create an ecosystem in your life that creates a culture of the kingdom of darkness. And I don't believe there's a neutral territory, so it's either one or the other. Prove that to me in scripture that there's a neutral territory um, and I'll agree with you, but I don't see it in the scriptures. Read it for yourself. Um, so there's an ecosystem that's created. Um, I, this sounds a little bit luxury right now. How are you guys doing? Are you guys awake? Okay, 
I, I figured some of this you've not heard before because this is all stuff I'm studying and I'm excited to teach. That's why we're, we're kind of extending the series on de- Deliver Us to get into this stuff. Um, so there are so many ways you can allow this to open up. Now, let me just quote Michael Heiser who wrote The Unseen Realm in this book. He has a book called Demons, great book. Um, it's wrecking me. But he says, look, there's no Greek word for possession or ownership that appears in passages to clarify or define the activity described by the, the word used for demonize. That's the, the Greek word. So a better translation for what's happened to this man is not possessed because that would mean he's being owned, but he's, he's severely demonized is a better translation. So then it begs this question, which I want to answer. Can Christians come under a high influence degree, a high degree of influence by demonic spirit? Or is it possible for Christians to yield control of their bodies to a demonic spirit in the same way that they yield to the power of sin? Yes, absolutely. Now, the definition that we use for possession, I don't think that can happen to a Christian. But all the other things can happen. So let me me explain first by giving you some text. So in the New Testament, there are clear passages that employ strong language that Christians can fall under the influence of Satan and evil spirits. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. He's talking about the church. Ephesians chapter 4, in your anger, do not sin. Anger is not a sin, but what you do with anger can become sin. And then he says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. If you hold on to that anger, and it leads to, to unforgiveness, to bitterness in relationships. The enemy gets a foothold. He grabs on. If you've ever gone rock climbing, you like grab on. If you're bouldering, you got a hold. The enemy has a hold. And then you will, if you continue in that, you're giving him more things to grab onto. And the, the instruction for the church is to, to, to release that anger in appropriate ways so it doesn't lead to this thing. James chapter one, it says, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Listen to what he says. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So this is a progression. We're going to be tempted by evil desires. We have desires that are not aligned with God's desires in our life. Anyone want to say amen to this? Anyone wake up and realize it's hard sometimes to do what Jesus wants you to do? Especially when those things look so good to us. Because it's like in Genesis chapter 3, it's not that the, the fruit on the tree wasn't appetizing to Adam and Eve. It was appealing to them. It looked good by eyesight. It looked good for consumption, but it, there was a no from God. And so there's this tension at times when there's these desires that we have inside of us and we're like, oh, it will feel good though. And everything in our culture is saying, yeah, just do what makes you happy. Do what, do, of course, it, that, that's what you were designed for. Pleasures, for, that's a good thing. Biologically, you were wired for this thing. Don't save it for marriage, which is God's word. You just, you, God's outside of time. I've heard this argument before with young unmarried people. Well, God's outside of time. I'm engaged. He can see that the covenant has been made. I'm like, that is you weaseling your way so that you can have premarital sex and justify it. I did. I love you. I love, I love, I always joke about the circuit riders being here because the fire from the circuit riders are here. We see some of you. We love that. I know that's their thing. So what demonic activity can look like? What does it look like? Man, I'm going over on time. Um, I'm going to keep going because you're my, you're my people. And I, I'm, I, and here's the thing. At other places, I try to end on time because I'm honoring their pastor. Um, this is home. So let's go. <laughs> We're going some extra innings. Let's go. Okay, what does demonic activity look like? All right, so you want to write this down because this is where it gets real practical. First of all, demonic activity in your life will look first like temptation. That's what we're talking about. All of us experience the enemy tempting us to sin. He did this to Jesus, right? 
I was just reading this in Matthew, like, Jesus, it's so interesting if you study temptation. Like, Jesus is baptized, and the Father says, this is my boy. I love you so much. I'm so pleased with you. That's how he begins ministry, the total affirmation of identity. Then he's led by the Spirit of God to be in the wilderness for 40 days, and he's tempted by the devil. All right, so now the accuser, the tempter comes. Hey, if you really are the son of God, do this. If you really are the son of God, do this. If you really are, do this. It's, and it's to provide food for himself at first. And then it's, and then it's the, the second temptation is to prove that God will protect him and, and give him visible success. And la- the last one is a shortcut to the thing Jesus was doing anyways. It's to take dominion back from Satan. He's like, I'll give it to you. Just worship me. So it's a shortcut to his ministry. It's exactly where he's going. And it starts with a temptation to prove his identity outside of the means God requires, which is what? Obedience. So temptation will always come after your core. It will come after things that you, you, it will be a distortion of your love, right? So it will be a distortion. Do you love this girl that you're engaged to? The temptation will be like, well, you're going to be married to her eventually. But that's a distortion of, no, you're created to become the kind of man that allows this woman's sexuality to flourish through covenant. And in that, yours will flourish. That's what it means to be a man. That's what it means to be a husband. To become the kind of man that creates a culture that your spouse can walk on and flourish because headship is laying down your life for your bride. How are we doing, church? It's redefinition of masculinity. Absolutely, it's strong. All right, we want to confuse strength with toxicity. That's not what's going on here. We need strong, praying, gentle, self-controlled men. The greatest power a man can give his wife and kids is self-control. All things that I'm in process learning. So, temptation, the second is harassment. You're repeatedly harassed in an area which you might fight well against, but it's extremely annoying and distract, distracting. Um, and this will play out. Remember, I'm not talking about like harassed with, you know, demonic butterflies coming at you spiritually. I mean, demons using work relationships against you, um, health issues against you, using their power to harass you, right? Um, I think even thoughts, this is the primary way I think he gets at us is using lies. He's the father of lies. He'll use lies over and over again to keep us in an emotional state of being down. We're not depressed. We're just saying yes to the lies and we've allowed our bodies to be controlled or under the influence of those lies. Anyone want to talk about that? In a couple of weeks, we'll talk about... Um, how truth encounters often bring about deliverance. Um, The third thing is oppression. Heavy attack, which is persistent and crushing. To use physical language, it's like an ever-tightening metal band around your head, gradually ratcheting up the pressure. So we, we become oppressed by the enemies. It's not just, you know, agitated harassment, these little things. Like there's a force that is oppressing us. Um, this is where persecution comes in. This is also where the in, enslavement to sin comes in. We're overwhelmed by an powerful force working against us. And I use this word, you know, pretty liberally, I would suppose. Like I would say, are you being oppressed by the enemy? Um, and, and most of it, most of us will experience those three things. This, this next one gets, gets a little more interesting for me. So, um, so the, the, the fourth one is habited. You get inhabited by demonic presence. It's inside of you. And I believe um, that there are places in the Christian's life where demons have come in. And they don't have possession over you. But they're, they, there's something you've carried with you. 
Um, as I've been praying about this, like, for example, like, there are things in your life that you've inherited from generations. There are things in your life that you just, there's no control. You, you've gone to therapy. Um, you've gone to various ways of getting, you've done the, the keto diet. You've done the fasting. You've done yoga. You've meditate. But there's still this explosive anger that constantly comes out. Now, some of that is your lifestyle. Some of that could be demonic. And I'm, I know this, I'm like, I'm preaching from the stage, but I'm just trying to process in real time because as I've been reading this stuff, I'm realizing there's so much out there. When you study the early church fathers, there was an expectation that everyone was carrying demons. Now, I know it's weird because our, our mindset goes to like the exorcist, like goes to like the scary, these things, but like there are impure, there are spirits, there are things you've been attached to, there are things you've opened yourself up to that you need to be delivered of. Okay, um, now I, this is gonna bring out all sorts of questions. So I have a lot of resources for you to read. So you're a disciple, you're a learner of Jesus, read the resources. You're not gonna get this just from me. You need to study the scriptures and understand these things. And I, the whole point of the series is that you become aware and useful for these things. So I just believe sometimes anxiety could be a spirit of anxiety. It's not always the case. Listen, some of you need to be on medication. Some of you need to go through therapy from PTSD. And you have anxiety associated to chemical amounts, 100%. And some of it is conditioned and some of it is demonic. Is that okay? I'm not going to get people angry later. If you are, it might be a demon. So I'll cast that out later anyways. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And, and this is why I'm being so careful because I don't want you to over-spiritualize everything. And I don't want you to be like, I got a demon in me or I'm like scared now. You probably do, but, but, <laughs> but you're owned by Jesus. And that's where oh, we'll get to in a second. Oh, don't worry, there's hope coming, which I need to get to. I'm like digging it in. They're like, where can I go? The last one's Possession. Demons have dominating control of a life. Um, they keep that person imprisoned. There's a prisoner held in darkness in solitary confinement, shackled to the cold stone floor. Christians, can they be totally possessed? I do not believe so. Believers are in Christ, meaning we belong to Jesus now. And as a believer, you are now Christ's possession, a prisoner of the Lord, which of course is what true freedom looks like. Now, Inhabited possession, inhabited Christians, yes. They're, here's what, I, I have prayed for leaders in the church at one point where they had physical pain and they're going through a dark season, a pain, painful season where they were oppressed and we, we gathered to pray and I watched this leader move like a snake. He wasn't possessed, but when we were exercising this demonic force that was put, placed on him by a curse from a cult when he was a child, there was a physical reaction to it. I've seen that a lot. Just this last Sunday, I was praying for someone that came up for back pain and I invited the Holy Spirit to come. I said, come Holy Spirit. And this little younger woman, she went, oh, like this. And here's what I know. When the Spirit comes on you, that's not from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> You're laughing. Like this, ah, feeling pain. It's not from the Holy Spirit. But what I do know, having been trained in this and prayed for thousands of people, is that as I prayed for a physical condition for the Spirit to come, something else was manifesting. And so then I just delivered. And she felt this, like I, she, I delivered her. The back pain went completely away. She became peace. Her, her arms were released from tension. Her neck pain went away. It was a demonic presence. And I need to say that that, that should be normative and casual. In the church. If we're going to expect healing, we're going to expect deliverance. Jesus wants to set you free. Some of you have a habit in your life that you have done counseling. You have done the 30 days. You have done the uh, iPhone accountability stuff. And some of it is a, is a stronghold from your childhood, from passed on from one father to the next. And Jesus wants to deliver you of a spirit that is impure. I didn't realize how much, this, how much time this would take. But I'm going to go to the next. Here's the problem in our culture. We have an obsession with information and medication. And it's kind of hard to web, in, web MD demonization, is it not? 
Like, that would just terrify me. If I'm, I already get scared, I got a sore throat and a runny nose, you could have cancer or a demon. That would just make it worse. <laughs> like, it's like, just click this back pain, soreness in, in, your, in your legs. Okay, you could have pulled a hamstring or you have a demon. That's just weird. And I, there are places that think that. And I don't want to become that place. But what I do know is that at some point, spiritual attack might require repentance and truth. It might require a being set free by the presence of the Most High God. And that we have been controlled and operating in a culture that is run by the enemy. And the demons, need, they have personalities, they have preferences, and we don't know what it looks like to necessarily have an unclean spirit, but they can dominate, dictate our personalities in, in some cases. And I've seen people use voices and personalities personalities and interests that were totally demonic and, uh, and, and controlled. But what I do know is that you can be set free. Look at what happens in the story. Let's get to the hopeful part. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then he said, what's your name? And he said, my name's Legion, for we are many. And then they begged Jesus again and again. So now they're pleading for their lives. Can I just say this? It's not a battle. I want to say this, that deliverance will not be a battle when you live in your authority. I mean, like, I've been in situations where people are trying to cast out a demon that's manifested in a gathering. I've seen it. And I've seen people try to do things. And they've never, been, they've never understood what, what is required in that moment. And what's required in that moment is for you to be who you are, a child of God and the authority of Jesus. There is no contest there's no contest. There's a book by Charles Kraft who wrote a book on deliverance and inner healing and essentially it's called Two Hours of Freedom. He's like, any demon can be cast out in two hours. I, I, we have to wake up to this. Do you know that in the Catholic Church up until the 60s, there was a position that you were ordained for to cast out demons. That's where the movie, The Exorcist, which by the way, to this day, has brought more people to the Catholic Church than any other movement. <laughs> it's a fact. Google it. That's why they had a, a role for the church. So he says, he begs and pleads, and then it says, uh, a large herd of pigs was feeding in a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. They can't do what Jesus won't allow them to do. He gives them permission. And what scholars say is they were probably a regional, de uh, a regional demonic presence. Right? We talked about this in the first week. The prince of Persian, a territorial stronghold demon that was over a territory that prevented the angel to come and deliver a message to Daniel. Go to, go to the first week on Deliver Us. You'll hear all about that. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Okay, I have to go through this because it's 46 minutes. There is a mysterious power in naming pain and opposition. The, the, have you ever noticed that, that, um, that if you study AA, the first step is to say I'm powerless over my addiction? It's just to name, this is what I'm dealing with. There is this power in naming the thing. Why do I believe in that? We make agreements with false beliefs and narratives and identity that become strongholds in our life. So the enemy exploits these ideas and it grows into jungles in our life. So we have false belief and we live out of a false belief and the enemy loves to keep you in things like insecurity, false identity, He'll, he'll say, he'll, he'll plant this seed as a child when, when your dad wasn't around that I'm not enough. So I'm going to prove to the world that I'm enough for the world. So I'm going I'm to use my intellect. I'm going to use my, my power, my achievement, because deep inside, I'm just a boy who wants to be affirmed by his dad. And the enemy exploits that tool. And he causes you to do things out of that motivation rather, that you've agreed to. He has, he has legal rights into your life because you're living from a place of lies, not of truth. So what happens is we take an idea and we make it an identity that is a lie. Things like, I will always struggle with sexual addiction. I will always be addicted to pornography. I will always struggle with lust. I will always struggle with this fear. I will always have anxiety. I will always be depressed. These are agreements that are binding to the enemy. It's, a, with, it's agreements with the enemy that are binding contracts that need to be broken. 
They need to be legally broken in the kingdom of God. Things like, I am not enough. I will always have. Brothers and sisters, will you always have anxiety? No, you won't. You, if you, here's the thing. The reality is, in the age to come, you will no longer have anxiety. In the age to come, you will no longer have sexual addiction. In the age to come, you will no longer struggle with lust. You will be made perfect. Now, do you recognize that we're inviting that age to come into this present moment? Now, I'm not saying name it and claim it. I'm saying at the very least, you will be set free by Jesus. You will be healed by Jesus at one point in this life or in the life to come. When we choose to live with an agreement with, that is founded on a lie, we build a life of lies in our lives. This is why in John chapter 8, it says, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we have to break the contracts we made, the agreements we make. What has power over you at this moment? What area in your life do you need freedom? It might not be as dramatic as things I'm naming, but what area in your life do you need freedom? We name it, and then we surrender it, and then we invite Jesus into it, and we allow him to respond. So if you're there and you're, you're insecure, you don't recognize that you're a child of God, that you're beloved, more than a conqueror, that greater is he who is in you than who's in the world, that you are strong in Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 10 says, the weapons we fight are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to make it obedient in Christ. So our, our battle in this world is to first name the things we've, we've agreed to, the, the false identities, the lies, to identify those things and begin to name them and invite Jesus into those things over life. And this is not the only way we transform. This is one of the ways we, we transform in Christ. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to put this all up here. I want to give you a way to pray f over these things as you come into them. Actually, I'm just going to save this. But look, you, at least you'll know it's here, okay? I'll, I'll, we'll email us out. I, I want to I spend time talking about this next week. So we'll just leave this here. Next week, I'm going to talk about how do you pray for the things that will begin to manifest. I want you to see it now. So take a picture if you want it so that you have strategy to pray against evil. Because the reality is when you start messing with this stuff, the enemy is going to be really angry. Anytime you begin to take ground in the kingdom, you're, you're taking ground that was occupied territory, so it will be challenged. Am I on your way? Sorry, you're going to get my picture, some of you. <laughs> Let me get my better side. There you go. No, I'm just kidding. So there's a prayer. I'm just going to pray it. You do this. In the authority and power and in the name of Jesus, I command you, evil spirit, to depart from so-and-so without harming them. Leave them quietly, and with dis uh, quietly without disturbance and go straight to Jesus Christ and never return. I pray now, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would fill my brother or sister with your love and Holy Spirit. This is a simple prayer that you pray for deliverance. And it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be hard. But what you do is you, you pray with authority. You command the spirits what to do. You tell the spirits where to go. You tell them what to do and how to do it. Sometimes you'll say, all right, come out of that person. And then that person starts screaming. This is all true. And then I've realized you can say, come out, of this, come out of this person quietly. Don't make a mockery of this child of God. You protect the dignity. What happens if we're gathering in worship and a demon uh, manifests in a gathering every time? The demon will try to take focus from God to himself. It'll be chaos. You're like, oh, we got to take him out. No, no, no. You take authority. Say, no, be quiet. Be quiet. You're not going to embarrass this child. This is Jesus' son, daughter. This is God, the Father. That's what you do. So uh, these are all things we teach in our, our deliverance training. I think it was taught this last Tuesday. The story ends. We'll catch this up next week. I'll just do part two. And uh, the story ends, and um, the, the entire community is shocked, and the man is sitting in his right mind. And Jesus, the, the, the man wants to be a disciple, wants to go and follow Jesus. And he says, no, 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 no. Go back to your people and tell them what God has done for you. And the next time Jesus comes back, it's not demon, well, it will be demon-possessed people. It's not the man from the tombs. It's crowds of people that have come to know that Jesus is Lord. And they come and Jesus has this crazy revival on that side of the lake. Because one man went around going, I was set free. I'm crazy Marvin. <laughs> 
and now I'm set free. All right, would you stand? I'm, I know I didn't land the plane very well because there's a, two pages of notes. I didn't time it out. I'm, I apologize. But let me just say this. Um, I think some of you are here. Just, can I just say this while you said? I think some of you are here, and what the Lord is doing right now through this series is he's tearing down the, the false ideas of God and the world with this series. Like his disciples who are in the boat going, wait, all of my superstition, all of my other ways of following Jesus, they're kind of being distorted. They're, they're being shaken right now. And I think Jesus is inviting you to understand who he really is. It's a new invitation to Jesus. The second thing is deliverance ministry. Look, you can't have Jesus and all the other things in your life. Like there's just no way. And in our culture, Jesus is just an accessory to all the other things. And one thing I learned from Don who passed away is at the end of the day, it's all about faith in Christ. The gospel requires a response. You either believe in Jesus or you don't. Some of you, you haven't said, I believe in Jesus. And when you believe in Jesus, you say, I don't believe in all the other gods that I've been worshiping. I don't believe in my career. I don't believe in my family over you, Jesus. Jesus, you are everything. Jesus will say, if you don't pick up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being my disciple. If you don't love me more than your kids, me more than your career, me more than your spouse, you're not worthy of me. That, we live in a culture, we want to make it easy. This is the call. We need Jesus. Some of you, you got a lot of issues and you're doing all the things you can do to make it better, humble yourself and come to Jesus. Let him come and heal and set you free. That the thing that got you here might be the anxiety, it might be the sleep issues, it might be the longing for community. The, the reality is it's Jesus that will set you free. It's Jesus that will, will make your soul right and give you shalom. Second thing is, I really believe that we need healing in this church. We need to be set free of things. And I can't reiterate this enough. I really want to see you free from habits that you don't even want to mention here. That we're all, we all have. We all have areas in our life where like, man, if I could just get that thing out. And I believe Jesus wants to set you free from that today and begin that journey. So can you just open up your hands? Father, would you come and do a miracle with this mess of a sermon? Would you bring truth and life and freedom? I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would allow us, God, to experience true transformation. If there's anyone here that is uh, recognizing that there are things that are underneath the surface that, they, that they've never been able to heal, God, would you deliver them and set them free? not by intensity, not by practices, not by spiritual disciplines, not by mindfulness or breathing or meditation, but by the power of your Holy Spirit would you set us free today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you, if you feel led to come forward for any of those things, would you just come forward? Uh, we want to pray for you. So we're going to worship right now. I want to invite you to come forward and receive ministry prayer. Um, so as we pray for one another, let's just invite the Holy Spirit to do his work. Jesus, you alone. 
his holy name everything that's in me bless 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 his holy name Everything that's in me, bless His holy name. Everything that's in me, yes, bless His holy everything. Everything that's in me, bless His holy name. Everything, everything that's in me, bless His holy name. If you haven't received prayer and you came up, just stay up here for a few more moments. Our, our team's gonna come and pray for you. Um, 
I just want to make sure that everyone gets prayer that needs prayer. Hey, church, I just want to pray over you before you go. Just ask God's protection. Would you open up your hands? I want to bless you. Father, would you just bless my brothers and sisters? I thank you for the commitment in this room to be faithful disciples of Jesus. I pray for those that are learning more about you. I pray for faith to be birthed today that would last for a lifetime. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you protect everyone here as they begin to navigate this world with uh, eyes that have unveiled the things behind the curtain. So Lord, bless this church as we go into the future. Bless my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Uh, if you need prayers, just stay up here. Our team will come and lay hands in just a moment. Thank you for being with us today. We would love to connect with you in an intentional way. So if you want to visit www.garden.church connect, you can find out the first steps that you can take in order to get more involved here at Garden Church. Yes, and if you haven't had a chance yet to download our app, you can go to garden.church app. Um, this is one of our primary ways of connecting with you through push notifications. You'll learn about special events and just different tools to grow in a relationship with Jesus. And with that, I just want to say, may the Lord bless you and keep you, Garden Church. May you experience God in a fresh way this week. Grace and peace.